Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to the TCU College of Education live chat. Today, we are discussing the impact of COVID-19 on our K-12 students and lessons we've learned about our educational system and the role of schools in our community. I'm Jan Lucina, Professor and Associate Dean of Graduate Studies here at the College of Education, and I'm happy to be here with Dr. Frank Hernandez. Hello, everyone. Thank you for joining us. Dr. Hernandez is the Dean of our college and has served for 30 years in both K through 12 and higher education. I'm also joined by special guest, Trayvon Jones. Hello, everybody. I'm so glad to be here today. Trayvon is a doctoral candidate here in our K through 12 educational leadership and joint MBA program, as well as an adjunct professor in the John V. Roach Honors College. This is his eighth year serving Fort Worth ISD and his second year serving as an equity specialist for their division of equity excellence. We have another special guest with us today, Faha Al-Trash. Hello everyone, thank you for having me. Faha has served for 11 years as the parent coordinator and community liaison at the International Newcomers Academy in Fort Worth ISD. Our experts will be answering questions you have about the impact of COVID-19 on K-12 education and the role of schools and educators in our communities. Please ask your questions in the comments section and we will answer those today. Before we get your questions, we'll begin with Dean Hernandez. What has COVID-19 taught us about the importance of schools for students and families, Dean Hernandez? Thank you, Jan. Um, I think we've learned a lot of lessons about COVID-19 in schools, and I think we're still learning lots of lessons. But some of the main lessons that I want to share with you today that we sort of have learned is this ideal of schools and school districts really drive the normacy that we all long for in our community. In some ways, they're the glue that really holds the community together. Um, even if you think about schools and communities and uh, school districts, they really drive our economy because much of what our community functions depends on schools running. And so one of the things we need to do is recognize the importance and appreciate the role that our educators, teachers and school leaders and district administrators play in not only caring for our youngest community members, but also sort of helping us with the normacy of our communities. And then second, um, there's been a lot of sort of um, push to get things back to normal, right? Open up schools, get kids back in there, get things back to normal. In fact, some parents and community members have even in some cases protested and have really challenged um, to get everything back to normal. And the thing that we're learning is that for some students and some families, getting back to normal actually is a little frightening for them. And here's what I mean by that, is that for some kids, getting back to normal is sitting in an in-school suspension room all day without any direct instruction. For some kids and families, getting back to normal is being pulled out of classrooms and being in remedial education all day. For some kids, getting back to normal is not having access to the rich, rigorous curriculum that their peers and their classmates have. And then for some kids, getting back to normal means having a disjointed, fragmented day where their programs and services uh, they're in and out of classrooms all the time. And so one of the lessons I think that we can learn is really think deeply about the ways in which we serve our students, the way in which program and services are provided to them and what we can do so everyone can have access um, to the rich, rigorous curriculum and, uh, and really succeed in schools. Thank you, Dean Hernandez. Trayvon, what do you think uh, COVID-19 has taught us about our educational system? Uh, Dr. Lucina, the first thing I would say is I believe Dean Hernandez read my notes before we started because everything that you were saying, sir, was, was on my mind to bring up today. So thank you for starting us in that place um, where that conversation could happen. Um, I think for me, what I will add uh, to what has already been laid out, um, the, the, the typical teacher who has gone to a great professional development on the flipped classroom where they want to be able to take their lectures and assign them as homework and then do some of the activities in classroom to be more hands-on. They were able to tell you years ago about the issues with access when it comes to Wi-Fi. So I think the first thing I would say is 
some of the equity issues that have come to the surface during this time, educators have been cognizant of as they have worked with students and have found ways to work through them. I think what's different now is in our collective consciousness, we're seeing these things play out in a very public way. Um, and the only other thing that I'll add there is when I think about the real new learning that's happening for me as an educator, it's this understanding that this system that I viewed as very rigid with a, with a very strict set of rules um, and these educators that I viewed as the flexible ones who were adapting, I now know that the entire system can change and adapt when it wants to. So that's what's brand new for me, knowing that this entire system that we have set up that we know systematically disadvantages certain groups of students in different ways, it can change if we have the will to make it do so. Thank you so much, Trayvon. Now, Faha, I have a question for you. You, yes. you work with communities of newcomers to the U.S. Can you talk a little bit about COVID-19 and how it has impacted the children and families you serve? Absolutely. Thank you very much. Uh, first of all, let me give you a very brief idea of the school I work with. It's the International Newcomer Academy. We cater to international students, either immigrants or refugees. And uh, the school have been in existing for 27 years. I had the privilege of working at that school for 11 years as the community coordinator, as you said. The biggest challenge when we face this uh, pandemic we are in now, the biggest challenge was for our students uh, were not or were or are really not prepared for technology. They come with very limited education from places in the world. Uh, unfortunate, it is not of their fault, but they, some of them don't know how to use the computer. Many of the families did not have internet connection. So when all this hit us, they were, we, we did everything we can. Uh, with the community help and of course Fort Worth ISD went beyond above their duty to make sure that we provide hotspots and the uh, internet connection to these kids but at the same time uh, they don't have the skills how to use it so it has been a challenge and as for the families and parents many of them work uh, jobs was easily cut uh, when this happened and it was also economic uh, challenge for we had to provide not only technology we had to provide food and support for the families pay bills uh, my person me personally I am privileged to work with a society that have been for 11 years so generous and supporting me and TCU in particular have been an amazing partner for us uh, across the board. So that has been a big challenge. The two main thing challenges are technology skills, they don't have it. And if we provide, it was hard to provide it overnight. So I am hoping that in the future, we will be better prepared and students will have more technology skills and work on technology in the classroom and they're a normal setting. We don't need to wait for pandemic like this to hit us to start. So I think it was a lesson to all of us. It is not only for the student, but as educator, all of us, we learned so much to maybe go different direction how to teach. Thank you. If you're just now joining us, we're hosting a panel with the College of Education Dean Frank Hernandez educational leadership doctoral candidate in Fort Worth ISD equity specialist Trayvon Jones, and parent coordinator and community liaison, liaison for Fort Worth ISD's International Newcomer Academy, Faha Al-Trash. If you have questions for our panelists, please type in the comments and we will answer those shortly. I'd like to pick, pick up now with Dean Hernandez. Dean Hernandez, what lessons do you think COVID-19 has taught our schools and districts? I think again, you know, change sometimes happens slow, but when we have a pandemic, we have to move fast, right? And be intentional about the kinds of things that we are wanting to do to meet our students. But the thing that we're learning is that not everybody has access to the same resources that are needed to really to stay engaged. This ideal of one size fits all, it's just not, applicable today. I mean, we really need to build relationships with our families so that we have firsthand knowledge 
about their needs so that we can work with them on their needs. The other thing that I think is important and that we are going, that we're experiencing now, but we will experience in the future related to COVID is that men, the mental health of our children and of our community members and their teachers is paramount. And the thing that we need to remember is that trauma related to that pandemic is not experienced equally across our community. The different communities experience different kinds of trauma at different kinds of levels. For example, some of our students have lost family members and some have not. Some of our students, their parents have lost their jobs and some have not. Some of our students have access to counseling and to therapy and to support to mitigate the kinds of <clears throat> mental health challenges they might have, and some other students don't. So I think one of the ways in which we need to think about that is that schools, I think, need to be open and willing to have honest and open conversations about loss, about grief, about um, inequalities, about oppression, about poverty, about the role that race has played in our communities around COVID and the role that it will continue to play in our schools around COVID. And so I'm encouraged by what I'm seeing with our schools, particularly here in the Fort Worth community. But I think it's something that we need to continue to focus on and be willing and open to have those conversations and so that we can all work together to really meeting the needs of our students and our school community. Thank you, Dean Hernandez. For those of you just to turn, tuning in, please send us a question and the chat box is, is open and we're ready for your questions. So let's, let's move on to Faha while we wait for some more questions. Uh, Faha, what lessons do you think educators and schools have learned during the pandemic, especially about what is most important in working with a, a marginalized community? I believe that, that number one, uh, we learned that we need to apply technology more in the classroom on daily basis, so students will be prepared and will be familiar. Number two, uh, uh, I, I am talking about my community, my my families, the families I work with. Uh, they uh, they need more resources in the community. They need to be able. We don't need to wait for situation like this. They need to be. We need to do better job introducing them to more resources in the community and ways of finding employment, finding uh, support, financial support. Even some of our families, they do work, but their work. Uh, I give you an example. Some of them they make eleven hundred, twelve hundred a dollar a dollar per month, but their rent maybe 1300 so it is not enough we need and there are so many generous uh, community partners are ready to open their heart and their wallets for our families but we don't know about it they didn't know about it i think we need to do better job having a list of introducing in normal setting making sure these families have ways to go uh, and get the help they need thank you Trayvon, we have a question from you in our chat box here, and this comes from Detra Johnson. Uh, Detra asks, how can we ensure equitable access for our students? Well, okay, awesome. Thank you, Ms. Johnson, for that question. Um, and I think I, I can wrap that into what I was going to be talking about anyway. Um, I think, Faha, you kind of described uh, this direct service element um, that really does incorporate some of the equity work we need to do, working directly with communities. Um, but Dean Hernandez, you talked about social emotional learning as well as partnerships and relationships. Um, and that actually gets to the point that I want to draw out for Ms. Johnson as well. I think when we talk about the, this, the, the, the equitable access for our families, the first thing that we have to have is equitable communication. Um, I know that I feel that schools that had authentic partnership with parents and communities when the pandemic hit were able to provide a better quality of instruction than other schools were. Why? Because no longer can we have proximity to control students. No longer can we change a seat to help them get work done. We're partnering directly with families to make that work happen. And so if there's no relationship and community there for that to take place, then we can't get that work done. Um, when we send out surveys or seek information from the community, when predominantly the feedback we're getting is from one or two zip codes, 
we aren't getting a full picture of what people need to even be able to provide for those things. Um, and so for me, it comes down to authentic conversations with community, um, specifically communities of color, so that we can figure out what are the needs that we need to be meeting and then making financial investment into those um, because we pay for what we want to have, right? Like if we want this to be a priority, if we want to serve communities well, let's do it. Thank you, Trayvon. We've got some great questions coming in from Facebook. Faha, this is for you. Um, how is INA working with students and families who may not have access to technology? We are very much at this point, I can uh, happily answer the question that our students have received hotspots or internet starting next week will be the first day of school for Fort Worth ISD. Uh, all our students up to my knowledge, we are working on it every day. Every student have access now to the internet, either hotspot or internet connection, and we are ready to go. We have, we have meetings, Zoom meetings all day, every day, uh, working how to make it as perfect humanly possible as it can. We are excited. It's going to do well. And, I can, and the students are excited to see their teachers, to see their friends, to see everybody. So at this point, we are ready to go. Everybody uh, have the technology they need. That's so good to hear, Faha. We've got more questions coming in on Facebook and keep on asking these questions. Here's another one from Facebook. Um, Trayvon, um, does Fort Worth ISD have a plan for providing meals for students who are eligible for free and reduced lunch if they're not attending Fort Worth ISD in person? Yes, and I, Faha, I can see that you are nodding as well. Yes, we do. Um, I know that it does involve very similar to what occurred um, this past semester, um, going to the schools and getting it during those designated times. So yes. Here's another important question coming from Facebook. Let's see, what type of supports are schools providing students um, and parents who would to address the mental health issues, technology equity and access issues? Who's the question for, two? That, that's for either Faha or Trevon. Hey, Trevon, do you want to start it? Um, I, I can definitely start. Um, I think many schools uh, in many districts are making the decision to to truly invest time into social emotional learning. Um, there's this rhetoric uh, around kids being behind. Um, I think it's important to note that we adults are the people who set those goalposts in the first place, right? Um, and so behind is our construction. Um, and so we get to decide, well, let's hold off on that for a minute and let's invest in our kids who are sustaining daily trauma, um, not just from COVID-19, but we have to keep in mind that civil unrest has occurred in our society in a huge way. I'm thinking about George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, Ahmaud Arbery, and the list goes on. Um, making that time to, in our classrooms, really just be about social emotional learning. Um, that can look like restorative practices, that can look like some other things, um, but not simply depending upon our counselors and interventionists to lead that work, because we all need it right now and all of our kids do. Uh, if I'm if I may add to that, uh, our like INA, our school, we have intervention specialists, we have uh, two counselors, high school, middle school, and uh, especially our kids, they come with a lot of drama, uh, trauma in their lives from whatever happened in their life. So teachers are watching, we are all watching, we talk to the parents, we communicate on parents' conferences and get information, uh, and uh, they are being catered to and the, the emotional and mental situation unfortunately it's existing among us or everywhere and we are very aware of it at the at least my school and fort worth isd and we have many many resources we have family centers uh, to we refer them to so we do our best to provide the service these kids and their families in they need and for food, the last thing, sorry, for food, we provide food and we have food pantries in many schools. My school have a food pantry and we are starting it. It was last year and this next week we'll start. They, families come, at least 50 families a week, they come and get food, uh, provided all kinds of food. And this year, even they are providing dairy product, fresh stuff. So we are excited for that, to give that extra support for the families. Thank you. 
This question comes from Nikki Ann on Facebook, and this is for you, Dean Hernandez. My district is allowing 25% phase in based off, off of a rubric and points allocated. Teacher, teachers' kids get points and 504 for if they're um, in special education. Do you think this is the most equitable way, equitable way to move forward? Well, uh, I'm not going to address sort of the, you know, the district policies of and sort of how the district sort of makes those determinations. But I think what we should be asking ourselves is, um, is our students are looking to us to see what we're going to do and how we're going to behave during this crisis. They're looking to us to see how important their safety and their well-being is. They're looking to the leaders to ask quite, uh, to find out how important it is for them to be engaged in school. And so part of what we have to do is, um, is to think about, um, and not to get sort of into whether schools should open and how much they should open, but in what ways can we together move forward? In what ways can we meet the needs of our students and our communities and our teachers? How can we create a win-win situation so that our children can see that the adults are working together collaborating and putting them at the forefront of every decision that we make. I think, yes, numbers and facts and all kinds of things are important and we should consider those. But in the end, we have to ask ourselves, is this a win-win for our community? And will our students and our children be proud of the decisions that we made on their behalf? Thank you, Dean Hernandez. You're watching the TCU College of Education live chat with our panelists, Frank Hernandez, Trayvon Jones, and Faha Altrash. Just a reminder to ask as many questions that you have for our panelists in the comments on Facebook. Faha, this is for you. As we think about getting back to normal, what do you think schools can do to, better, to be better prepared for the future? Again, I think I already uh, mentioned that. It's for the future, we need to apply more technology. We need to prepare our students, uh, make sure they know how to use it in case we have to do remotely, uh, teaching remotely. And that is, that is the, biggest, the biggest obstacle was in our way. I am talking about our, my school, uh, which is, uh, yes, we provide technology. We have laptop, we have hotspot, but these kids, Probably they, learn, they know how to turn on the computer. That's it, period. When you tell them to go to the Google Classroom, when you tell them they don't know. So we need to, again, apply it in everyday life, uh, dedicate a few days every week in the classroom to do that, uh, like if they were remote, remotely being studying. So if something happened for any reason, we are, re we are ready to pick up and go from there. Okay. Um Frank, we, our Dean Frank Hernandez, we have a, a, a posting coming in from you on Facebook from Kara Jones. Um, what questions should educational leaders be asking about the purpose of school during this time? There are lots of questions, right, that educational leaders should be asking. I think what we need to, um, one of the things that we need to do is, you know, teachers are trained and leaders are trained school leaders are trained to be creative and innovative to solve problems. They do this for a living every single day. They're engaging with students, with families, with community members. And so one of the things I think that leaders should be really asking themselves is, in what way am I contributing to, to a solution uh, with this crisis around the pandemic? In what ways am I collaborating with other school leaders or my, uh, the teachers in my school and district administrators to really think deeply about um, the consequences and the unintended consequences of the way in which we move forward. Um, they need to hold themselves accountable to the decisions that they make. Um, and in the end, they have to realize that these are real families um, that are experiencing lots of things right now during this pandemic and work in the best interests, I think, of their children and of their school and of the district. But I think you know, one of the most important things for them to do is to really come together as a community, really come together as a community of leaders or a community of teachers and really begin to think through some of the questions that we're asking, asking and addressing today. 
is what has the pandemic taught us about how we have organized our schools? What has the pandemic taught me about the way I think about my own leadership so that we can adjust and adapt in future moments like this? And so we're not caught off guard. Um, that's the thing that I would say to school leaders and also to teachers and district administrators about the pandemic and what they should be thinking about. Thank you, Dean Hernandez. Trayvon, we have a question that's been posted on Facebook for you from Sonia Warren Williams. She asked, how are school districts providing for the social and emotional support for teachers and other employees concerned about contracting COVID-19 when they return to campus? Yeah, I, I think that that is a really authentic question. Um, and I think that it deserves a really authentic answer. Um, as, as I do my, my Twitter research um, and just listen to kind of what's going on and like what people are doing, um, I quite honestly have not heard a whole lot. Um, I, I agree for the need to, to do something, to really build community, to really build a, build a support for the social emotional needs of the adults who are in the system because not only have we endured trauma, but schools never closed, right? Like we've been open and, and we've been working and we've been educating people and we've been trying to support our community. Um, and, and all of that takes a toll on a person. Um, and so I'm, I'm going to be perfectly straightforward and say, I don't know of any sweeping plans to do that anywhere. Um, I do think um, in schools that I have been to and visited I have heard really authentic conversations. I participated in one this morning where um, a campus had a conversation about race and they, they talked about what was going on in the world. They talked about their personal experiences and they came together as a community and it was beautiful and it, it went off the timeline, but they, they knew that they needed that conversation. Um, and, and COVID came into that and, and recent events and even a touch of politics rolled into that conversation, but it's what the real humans in the system needed to happen. Um, I, I will choose to believe in this moment that that is happening in a lot of places, but I, I don't have a big plan to address in a big way that I know of. Thank you, Trayvon. We've got a lot of questions coming in from Facebook. Thank you all for posting these important questions. Dean Hernandez, um, what role should stakeholders' voice play in shaping decisions about, school di about how school districts move forward this fall? Well, I mean, you know, we've been talking about community members and parents and the business community. Um, I think it's important um, during this crisis, and I do believe that districts have been doing this, they've been hitting the ground listening. They've been trying to get a sense of what are the concerns of community members? What are the concerns of the business community? And then what are the concerns of our students? Take those into account to really try to make the best decision that they can in terms of how we sort of think about schooling and bringing um, that community back together again. I think um, the one thing I also wanna add is that so much of teaching and so much of school is about relationships. Right? It's about the connections that students have with their teachers and the connections that teachers have with the school administrators and the school administrators with districts and with parents and those sort of things. And not having those have really, has really thrown us for a loop. I mean, it's, we've, we've, we've created some strategies, but part of what I think we have to do, um, similar to what um, uh, our other guest panelists have said, is that we really have to think about how is it that we think about the way in which we care for ourselves? How is it that we balance everything that's expected of us with taking care of ourselves and our families? And how is it that we can engage um, with community members in the best and the safe way of moving forward? But I still think we can't lose sight of this moment and asking ourselves, in what ways can schools adapt and redesign themselves in a way um, so that we can meet the needs of our students and really take advantage of this moment that we've been giving to sort of think through that. I think it's important for us not to lose sight of that conversation. Thank you, Dean Hernandez, and thank you all for all the questions that are coming in. Um, Frank, Frank, Dean Hernandez, we have another question for you from Leslie Eckby. 
Um, Leslie asked, how can educators push for social justice in the classroom during a time of civil unrest? I think it comes to an earlier question that I answered, and that is that we have to be willing and open to have critical conversations around um, issues of race and racism, issues of poverty, issues of oppression, issues of trauma, and having those questions openly uh, with students and with teachers and with school leaders, district administrators and community members. I mean, one example um, that I think that sort of takes a conversation from one place to the next is, um, is allowing students to ask the why questions. You know, why is it that this has happened? Um, why is it that I'm afraid um, when I leave my house or when we go and do this? I think it's important also for colleges of education, like the one here at TCU, we also have a responsibility as well. We train teachers and principals and leaders for the nonprofit uh, communities and also counselors. We need to be able to prepare them to have these authentic questions about the kinds of experiences that are happening around uh, racial unrest in this country. And we need to do it in authentic and in a way that we acknowledge the kinds of questions that our students have. So I would say we need to be able to have those public conversations about how what's happening around racial equality in our country is impacting each one of our students and our families and community members and accepting that as truth and then working to support the kinds of questions that our students and our families have. Thank you, Dean Hernandez. The next question that's just posted on Facebook is very similar to the one you just answered, but it, it, it is um, addressed to all three of you. This comes from Liz. Liz says, I think it's important for school leaders in our area to discuss why more Latinx families are being affected by COVID-19 and how can we help better educate our leaders and talk to them about school and talk to them more about school and local agencies. So the question is for any of you on the panel. What specific strategies are you using to promote social emotional learning in daily practice? I think I think for us for for INA being diverse uh, uh, like uh, some years we have 30 languages uh, 40 nationalities, it is diverse. And we have to make sure everybody on the same page. I, I hope I am answering the question the way it is stated and to make sure that everybody feel they are equal to each other. There is equality. There is, uh, nobody is better. It doesn't matter what color of your skin is or what language you speak or what part of the world you come from, you are going to be treated in America like everybody else and we are equal. That's that's the way I, I would answer it from my experience working with international students and as a human being. Thank, thank you. This one is for you, Dean Hernandez. It's from Kathy. Um, what changes in education has the pandemic created? Well, I mean, they, it's, I mean, some of the changes we don't even know about today, right? I mean, there's been an enormous amount of changes around education related to technology, related to access to healthcare, related to the ways in which communities have access to the kinds of resources that they need. Um, one of the questions that was um, addressed earlier about Latinx families and the number of COVID cases, I think one of the things that school leaders and teachers, and I know they're doing this, but we need to continue to sort of think about it, is, um, is spend time in the uh, Latinx community, build relationships with the businesses and the families that are there. And you'll have a better understanding that in some cases, there are multiple generations of family members who live in one household because, um, because it's, we're you know, committed to being together and to supporting each other. And so one of the reasons why there's more cases is because there may be, in some cases, more family members living together or caring for an elderly parent. In fact, in my own personal life, my mother, who's 77, lives with me and my family, and we care for her. And so part of what we have to recognize 
is the idea again about one size doesn't fit all and that it really is about when we turn the corner school leaders and teachers like many of the like our panelists are doing even today they must connect with the community in a much more authentic and real way to really know the deep challenges and successes that our students and our family are having so that they have a better understanding of how to build relationships with them. So those are just a little bit of some of the changes that have happened over this past year. Thank you, Dean Hernandez. You're watching the TCU College of Education live chat with our panelists, Frank Hernandez, Trayvon Jones, and Faha Altrash. Just a reminder to ask any question you have for our panelists in the comments on Facebook. Trayvon, this is a question we've been talking about for the last um, few minutes, but I think it's important to ask the question again. We've seen ways in which COVID-19 has affected K-12 students and highlighted existing inequalities in our educational system. Trayvon, can you talk a little bit about how schools or districts can make impactful changes to address equity moving forward? Um, thank you. Um, I do. I think I would start by talking about teachers. Um, I mentioned a little bit earlier that I believe that the system was rigid and educators were flexible. Um, I think that flexibility still holds true in this moment um, because teachers who were self-proclaimed bad at technology have learned some technology tools <laughs> during this time. Um, you know, teachers who are used to some of the more conventional methods of keeping kids on task, um, being able to pull kids aside, being able to move them to a different seat, being able to stand nearby them. They have learned how to engage kids in a different way, um, especially teachers that are teaching virtually, especially when that synchronous time is optional. Um, they are really having to capture kids and build community in a way that's different. And they're rising to that each and every day and trying to get better at it. Um, so I think that some of that work, some of that impactful change at the classroom level is taking place. I think for me, the most impactful thing that um, districts can do, which many of us on the call today have referenced this, um, don't, don't let the marker for you be returning back to the way things were in February. Um, really allowing yourself to release that as the goal. Um, because as long as we're trying to get back to what February was, we're trying to get back to a place that was not equitable for our students anyway. Um, and so to be really clear on that, that just know what you're running towards. Like as we run away from the COVID pandemic and the difficulty of educating right now, let's not run back to something that didn't work that well either. Um, and so that's for me is the most impactful thing. Thank you, Trevon. This question comes from Laura Caps on Facebook and it's for any of you, any of our panelists. How do you suggest we parents address the learning our kids need this year that are that are in crucial grades like fifth or eighth grade where they, where they will move on to bigger challenges next year? I think that's a question many parents are, are thinking about right now. I can I can jump on that one first. Um, I think for me, for me personally, um, and my wife reminds me of this with our one-year-old when I want to, you know, take him to his bedroom and point at the alphabet on the wall and then have him recite the colors with me and then go over the numbers. She says, wait, wait, children learn naturally. You don't have to do that. Like what you're trying to do is actually counterproductive. Um, she's much smarter than me and also an educator. So, you know, um, but this idea that learning only happens inside of a school building, I think is problematic too. Um, our students who are in their homes, in their communities right now are learning a lot still. And so I, I don't wanna discount that. Um, I think I would also say that the, the, the humanity of it all is much more important to me in this moment. I'm sorry, I'm, I'm like spinning in my chair. Anyway, um, the humanity of it all is much more important to me personally right now. So thinking about does my child feel okay? Does my child feel safe? Um, again, for me as a parent, my child is one. Nearly half his life has existed with only seeing a few people. I'm, I'm trying to figure out how to navigate that moment. You know, if, if the talking comes later, if the alphabet comes later, I'll be okay as long as I know that I can help him emotionally navigate this moment and understand what the world 
is like and that other people exist. Um, and so really, for me, releasing some of that academic pressure that we as educators have created. Um, but then lastly, I think I'd say, don't underestimate the power of your educators when, when you are able to return back to them. Um, daily, teachers encounter challenges with gaps, with um, prior knowledge that isn't quite where they would like it to be, and they meet kids where they are and they teach them. Uh, and it will be no different when your child is able to safely return to a classroom. And so I, for me, I, I would trust that and just take care of my child. Thank you, Trevon. There are many questions coming in from Facebook. Um, here's a question for you, Dean Hernandez. Um, there's a shared fear among parents that kids will be behind due to virtual learning. What are your thoughts about um, children falling behind and how this affects schools throughout the country? Yeah, I think um, I'd like to address the, uh, the question earlier as well, um, where Trevon talked a little bit about um, you know, learning and those sort of things. I think, I think what's important right now is that we want kids to be creative and innovative. I mean, we're so focused on math and science and reading, and yes, those are important. But students who solve amazing problems and who can um, tackle the next math challenge that they might have are kids who are really given the freedom to be creative and to be innovative and to think outside of the box. And so in some ways, the parent that was asking the question about the fifth and the eighth grader, um, this is the best time to understand what their interests are and what would they want to explore, right? I mean, the, you know, I mean, in school, it's sort of laid out for them, but find out what they're interested in, find out how to build their creativity, try to find out ways that they can build their own innovative thinking around problem solving and the things that they're interested. Um, and then the other question I think, uh, Dr. Lucina, that you were asking was about, uh, can you repeat that question for me, please, one more time? Let's see here. My screen has moved up. Um, okay, so what are your thoughts about who is being marginalized um, and who's being left out and how that effect affects schools throughout the country? Yeah, that's right. It was about um, the impact of virtual learning, right? I mean, this is really back to this idea that, um, that schools function so much on relationships and connection um, and being close to each other and and um, supporting individual students and building friendships and those sort of things. And I do think it, there's gonna be an impact. Um, but I think what we need to do is think about what are we learning about our children and the way in which they uh, address this crisis? What are we learning about the kinds of strategies that they're creating? What are we learning about the tools that we're teaching them right now to how to engage differently and creatively um, in this world of, of, of COVID when we can't sort of have those kinds of relationships that schools so often provide for us. So, um, so I would say that, um, that students have a tendency to be resilient. Students have a tendency to bounce back, um, but we need schools that will help them do that and will not sort of look at COVID necessarily as a deficit perspective, but say, you know what? our children learned lots of things during this pandemic and we're going to find out what those things are and we are going to use them to our advantage and if it means that our students can be more creative if it means that our students can be more innovative if it means that our students have developed new strategies to deal with crisis and with other kinds of things then you know what let's build on those strengths and not look at this as a step back even though we know students will potentially you know, may fall back in some of the content, but schools are more than just content. Schools are more than just math problems and science experiments. Schools are about developing the whole child and we can't lose sight of that. Thank you, Dean Hernandez. So for you, for you all just tuning in, you're watching the TCU College of Education live chat with our panelists, Frank Hernandez, Trayvon Jones, and Faha Al-Trash. Just a reminder to ask any question you have for our panelists in the comments section. So Faha, this one's for you. 
What lessons do you think educators and schools have learned during the, during the pandemic, especially about what's most important in working with marginal, marginalized communities? You've talked a little bit about this already, but, but we really want to learn even more about how can we best meet the needs of our children in marginalized communities. Uh, I believe I think the, uh, the most important is to uh, to build uh, community connection, uh, community relations, and we we need mentors for for especially our uh, the type of students we have and their families. It is easy to hand money or to do something, but we need somebody to mentor. We need to build that kind of relation, mentoring, and having uh, connecting families and students with certain people that can help them on daily basis on a long time. We can't, as teachers, as educators in school, we cannot be ha hundreds of people at the same time. We need help. We always need outside help. And for that reason, uh, we need to build better relation with the community. And the community is ready to step up and to take, to take over as, as long as we knock on their doors. So that's, uh, to me, to all of us actually, uh, teachers, uh, myself and everybody learned how amazing the community around us and how, uh, how willing they are to help in every way they can. They drive to home, they deliver food, they, take, uh, they teach students. So before all this, we were very much just come to school, attend the classes and then go back home. Now we are building a much bigger picture for these families and hopefully uh, sadly through this situation it happened but I hope that will be a positive uh, income for us to do it to keep continue doing it and that's my mission uh, at this point is to uh, to build as many community partners as possible and I hope we need them for good time not bad time but they are ready to help thank thank you so this next question is on Facebook and it is for all three of you. Um, what are some ways that Fort Worth ISD is providing support and or flexibility to, to its teachers who are tasked with supporting students both in person and virtually? I understand. Okay, go ahead. Okay, go ahead. I understand uh, through the district that for teachers that have underlined the situ uh, health problem or any situation, those will be able to teach from home. Is that the question? Is that what you are asking? Well, I think it's, it, we're asking um, how is Fort Worth ISD providing support and flexibility? So for its teachers. Yeah. So, that's, yes. Yeah. Okay, yes, they are, they are very clear about it. Uh, I believe if a teacher is a new teacher, and maybe Trevon can also add to that, if they don't have the experience more than, they have to have at least two years experience to be able to teach from home and to do it uh, but, uh, remotely. But at the same time, they can be, if they are less than two years, they have to be on campus so they can have the support of the administrator in case there is situation, even though they are teaching virtually and remotely with the student, but those teachers with less than two years have to be on campus. Otherwise, uh, if a teacher chooses to teach from home, at least for the first eight weeks, that's what we understand, uh, four weeks, sorry, four weeks as at this point, we don't know if it's going to be extended or not, but that's the last information we received. Um, I think I, I would add um, on this particular question, um, in my particular understanding of the situation, uh, we don't really have, um, because of the way decisions were made, there isn't a teacher in this moment who is having to support both virtually and in-person students, um, besides their own children, perhaps. Um, and so I know that Faha kind of explained the way that teachers are able to work to support students virtually. Um, and it's my understanding that primarily instruction is being given virtually. Yes, yes. Special education situations. Okay, I, I, I want to make sure that no, no student in person in their own campus, but teachers, if they are less than two years experience, they will be on campus uh, in case they need support from the administrator, but no students on campus. Thank you. Dean Hernandez, and this one is a higher ed question for you from Facebook, in what ways can higher education play a role in times like COVID-19? I know that the focus of this uh, conversation is really about K-12 schools 
and sort of the lessons that we've learned related to COVID. But higher education should not get a pass during this time. Um, we do have a responsibility to really support our partners, our school districts, our nonprofits, our community business in the best way that we can, which means that we need to be at the table with them talking about these challenges. Because in the end, if you think about every single, almost every single employee in the school districts, most of them have been trained in higher education institutions. And they're applying their learning to this situation currently. Some of them are new, some of them may be veterans, right? But all of them have been trained in this institution of higher learning. And so part of our responsibility is to commit to our community members that we also will learn lessons from this pandemic and we will apply them to the way in which we think about teacher training, the way that we think about principal training, the way we think about counseling training, and the way we think about our students who work in the nonprofit community. And by that I mean, in what ways can our graduates pivot and change quickly? In what ways can they adapt to a situation that's new to them, but still hold true to the values of the communities and hold children and their best interests in the forefront of the work that they do? So there's a lot of work for us to do. We've started some of that work already by posting some resources for parents and families on our website, for those that are at home who need a little support about designing lessons or different activities they could do with their children. But we will challenge ourselves to continue to do more and more because we do have a responsibility and we don't get a pass during this pandemic. Thank you, Dean Hernandez. And this is our, our last question, and this is for all the panelists. Do you have any other thoughts that you, that you would like to add to this topic? I've got one more question coming in on Facebook from Jonathan Perez. Um, is it the responsibility of the institution, not the community, to support marginalized group? What is TCU doing to develop teachers with racial with a racial equity lens? I can I can attempt to answer that a little bit, and maybe Trevon can talk a little bit about his own experience at TCU. But one of the things that um, our university and our college has been intentional about is making diversity, equity, and inclusion a core value of the work that we do. And one of the things that I've challenged our own college faculty and our own staff is to say, if we believe that Black Lives Matter, how will our Black community members know? If we believe that diversity and equity and inclusion is a core value, how will our Fort Worth community know? It's not enough just to talk about diversity, equity, and inclusion. We actually have to do something. And so some of the things that we're doing already is to really challenging our students in the College of Education to think, to think deeply about their own experiences with issues of diversity, for example, race and racism or sex and sexism and those sort of things, and begin to understand how they can learn more about themselves and the way in which they think about these, and then really help them understand the kinds of communities that they need to be engaged with to learn more about themselves but in the way in which they'll meet the needs of the communities that they're a part of. So we have a long ways to go, but it's something that we're committed to, that we are determined um, to continue on that journey, knowing that we will never ever sort of meet, right, the end of the road, but that we're committed to doing that work every day with our students. Um, I think from the student perspective, um, what I would add, uh, those of you that know me personally know that I have spent all of my 20s at TCU attempting to graduate. Um, and so I have seen a lot during that time. Um, and I think the, the biggest takeaway for me um, is while TCU as a whole isn't, isn't where I would want them to be as a university in such a diverse city, um, I have seen the College of Education change in a lot of meaningful ways during that time. Um, when I first started, like we talked about racism, sexism, and other isms. Um, but the, the, the depth of that conversation has changed. And it's, we've moved from like there being one class on 
on race and equity to that, that conversation being threaded throughout. Um, and so I can definitely say I've noticed that. I've also noticed um, a change in, in the demographics of the teaching staff in the College of Education, um, which does show a commitment to, to that diversity, um, as well as honestly uh, in my classmates as well. Um, the recruitment of students has been different, um, where we're seeing more diverse cohorts um, come into the graduate program. And so I, I do see those moves happening. And I, I look forward to supporting as the work continues. Thank you, Trevon. So before we close, do any of you panelists have um, anything else that you would like to add in closing? May I say uh, just uh, briefly that TCU have been amazing with our students. I, right now, we do have around eight students with full ride scholarship at TCU, they are from all over the world. I'm literally from over some, from Burma, from Nepal, from Congo, from everywhere, from Iraq. And it has been, they uh, treat everybody fair. And our kids, they truly come with one dream, to be in this amazing nation of ours, what we call America. This is the best, this is the dream for everybody. They come here uh, dreaming for better education, better life, and that's where they are here. And they have been, I, I am grateful to, to work with institution as TCU that uh, they treat everybody the same and the opportunity and the door is open for every qualified student and they go above and beyond to make sure these kids receive the best education. And I look forward to continuing the journey with TCU and uh, it is an honor to be with all of you. Thank you for inviting me. <laughs>